Thanks again for joining us at the 2021 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference Competitive Advantage Talks presented by Kager, also known as Craft Analytics Group. My name is Jack Blasberg, and I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan. And it's my pleasure to introduce our presentation, The Ideal Sports League. Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Philip Maiman, Professor of Analytics and the Director of the Master of Science in Business Analytics Program at the Fairfield University Dolan School of Business and advisor to Athletes Unlimited to the stage. Thank you, Jack. Really happy to be here. Um, it's not every day you get to talk about an ideal league. It's not every day you get to start an ideal league. What isn't the league? You know, as a kid, you grow up thinking maybe I'll be an athlete, right? Everyone thinks that. Or then you get older and you think maybe I'll be a coach or a GM or, or a team owner or something. But it's almost unthinkable, right? It's almost outside the realm of imagination to think I'm going to start a new sports league. But it's been done. That's what Athletes Unlimited did. And I'd like to tell you about some of the challenges and solutions that we came to uh, as a team. This has been... Uh, obviously a, a, a very collaborative environment, many people involved with all of the things I'm about to show you. Uh, we have meetings, you know, twice a week talking about analytics and, and the sports. Uh, we had a fantastic softball season, volleyball season is halfway over, also be, being very successful. What is an ideal sports league? If you were to be able to start a league on your own from scratch and you didn't have any of the baggage of historical uh, leagues, uh, what would you do? One thing that we almost mindlessly think is, has to be the case because it's always been the case is that athletes have to be supposedly paid based on their expectations of future performance. Now it's fine. It's a free market, do what you like. But uh, what that means is you have huge salaries, hundreds of millions of dollars for many years of expected performance. Uh, if an athlete does better, they feel they're underpaid. If they do less, the team feels that they're overpaid. There could be a lot of friction there. Why not pay on the basis of pure performance? You, what you did, what you contributed, great. That's what you get paid for. Uh, like if you, if you get an Uber driver, if you hire somebody, you typically pay for performance, not for expectations of future performance over many, many years, right? Here's what you did. Here's what you should be paid. So if we were to start a new league and, and from scratch and think about new things, maybe one thing we would want it to be is meritocratic, so that you're compensated largely based on actual performance. Uh, the way Athletes Unlimited actually works is that you have a base salary, of course, but then as you top the leaderboard, as you produce more and more, you get paid more and more. That's the number one uh, characteristic. That, that should be of an ideal league, right? Because then people are incentivized to put their heart, their full performance out there on the table. This is it. This is all, this is what we could do. And we make the most we can of our production. Number two, you'd want it to be comprehensive. So it includes not just the tangible performance that we're all used to with stats and metrics, but also the intangibles. Every sport has intangibles. So one way we'll come to do that with Athletes Unlimited is to have an MVP voting where players vote for who they think was the best player of each game. That gives some boost to uh, players who may have contributed in intangible ways. Very importantly, we want it to be complete. We want to have a single leaderboard where the athletes go up and down based on their actual production and MVP points and other things. And it's across all positions. Every sport has different positions. Uh, every team sport, some are more flexible than others, more fluid than others. Uh, in, in softball, there's obviously pitching. Pitching is different than other things. In, in volleyball, there's liberos. They're different. Um, in basketball, in, in soccer, every sport has its own kind of differences across positions. But we don't want to have leaderboards for different positions because then we don't have pure performance overall. Uh, it's not a complete system. Um, so that's another goal is to have a complete system across all positions. And of course, it has to be simple, easy to calculate, right? If you're watching the game, you don't want to whip out a machine learning model to be able to understand where you're, which way your team is going. It has to be something you could do even without a napkin. Um, just because it's complete doesn't mean it's fair. We may have a leaderboard, but if certain positions are advantaged relative to others, and of course that's a natural case, right? In any sport, there are going to be some positions where you're more exposed to certain opportunities that provide value to your team than others. Uh, it's not all the same. However, there could be a way to calibrate, and so far it's, been, it's worked out very well, both in softball and volleyball, that any player at any position at least has a chance to be the number one player on the leaderboard, number one athlete. Uh, 
uh, sixth, we'd want it to be a competitive league, right? You want balanced teams. You don't want the best team. There's obviously always going to be a best team, but you don't want the best team to just dominate and win like 20,000 to three or something like the, the Harlem Globetrotters, right? And you also don't want it to be too much parity. You don't want it to be 50-50. So every game is a coin toss. That's not exciting either. So that's a delicate balancing act too. We'll see how that worked out. And finally, uh, if we're starting with the league where we don't need the coaches, GMs, teams, we don't need any of that framework. We really want to focus on the athletes. That's what we're here to see, right? Uh, the way Athletes Unlimited works is the top four athletes on the leaderboard every week, they become the captains and they start drafting their teams. Uh, if we see that the way they draft has nothing to do with the leaderboard, then that means the leaderboard, there's something wrong with it, right? Now, it doesn't have to match perfectly. There's obviously uh, the captains will have decisions based on team composition and positions and friendships or synergies, anything else. But there should be a general trend that higher in the leaderboard should mean you're being drafted higher. So we'll check on that as well. Um, what are some of the problems and challenges that we can come up, up with and how do we solve them? Well, Here's our main uh, uh, approach. We have three different ways of scoring every athlete's performance or production. One is their individual stats. You know, you get 10 points for a single, 20 for a double and so on. Fine, that's their individual contribution. But they also get win points just for being on a team that won the game or each inning. Each inning is a great way of uh, reducing the disparity between the top team and the bottom team. Because even if you're a better team, there's probably the other team will win at least an inning or two. Uh, so having those kinds of win points helps a lot. And the MVPs, as we talked about, if you get the number one votes, you get 60 points and so on. So what are the challenges? Drafting in teams, um, you could be the greatest athlete on earth, but if you don't have the skills to draft and build a team, you may not be very good at it. Uh, however, that's where the leaderboard helps you come in. If you're totally lost, if you're a captain and you have no idea who to pick, uh, you can see the leaderboard, right? And then you can decide and you can see who's actually contributing. Uh, we can look at the uh, errors we have to worry about. So if you make a mistake, obviously there should be some penalties for certain kinds of activities. Um, and, but you don't want to affect the risk-taking behavior of individuals, right? You don't want an athlete to not do something that, they, that would be for the benefit of the team because they're worried about the leaderboard. So that's, that we address with uh, the calibration between the negatives and the positive. We want the incentives to align. Of course, we want every, even though every athlete is jockeying for position on the leaderboard, we still want them to win. It's a team game. They have to win the team game. Uh, for the intangibles, we have the MVP votes. That The MVP votes is not purely intangibles, of course, because you're voting for players who probably also contributed tangibly with some of the metrics, but it helps get at that otherwise impossible to get intangible situation. And the different positions that between pitchers and non-pitchers or in volleyball between the barrows and outside hitters and all these other things, those can be calibrated as well. So now we'll test to see how it works. In historical back testing, we can simulate a couple of things and see how it works. So even before the season starts, we had a lot of sense of how it should go. So remember, uh, if you're winning a game, you get a bunch of points. And if you win an inning, you get points. If you score things this way, that changes the way we look at uh, winners, right? So, here, so imagine we have four teams and we're just simulating the first team is better than the second, better than third, better than the fourth. You don't want the team, team one is best, the best team, but how much do you want it to dominate by? One measure of domination is a Gini coefficient. That's a concentration usually used for income inequality or wealth inequality or concentration of wealth. And uh, if we score things using the standard traditional wins only thing that counts is wins, not innings, you get a Gini coefficient that's basically 0.41 basically all the time, which is pretty high. It's very highly concentrated and it's very uh, fixed. There's no movement around there. Whereas if we use the Athletes Unlimited scoring system where we allow points for the opposite team for scoring each inning and for the winning team to score to win each inning, the not only does the average Gini coefficient drop down to 0.34, but there's much more diversity, right? There's much more interesting things that can happen than just team A dominating. So, but that's in simulation. The other thing we can look at is back testing. Now, of course, we don't have a back testing softball league that was playing by our rules at the time, but we do have MLB, with, which carried all the stats. And we can reevaluate baseball players in Major League Baseball using our scoring system. Jack, tell us what do you think when you look at these uh, tables? The blue is uh, MLB based on war, and uh, the yellow is R based on the Athletes Unlimited scoring system. What do you see? Thanks, Philip. The thing that stands out to me right away are the players at the very top of the two lists. On the war list, seeing Mike Trout, I know he's a player who has a lot of great individual statistics, but his teams haven't necessarily done so well in recent years. 
Whereas on the top of the athletes unlimited scoring list, Cody Bellinger and the Dodgers have won a world series and gone deep into the playoffs the last several years. So right off the bat, the athletes unlimited scoring model looks like a little bit better way of capturing both that combination of individual performance as well as team success. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's nice. There's also, this is maybe not as obvious to notice, but look at the drop in from the score from the first to the 10th player. It's 600. What is this? 15%, something like that. But the drop here is much larger. So the concentration of production in war is much, much higher towards the top one or two players than it is in our Athletes Unlimited system. So it's, uh, it's a more equitable uh, distribution of points. And it allows, of course, as you mentioned, that uh, being on a winning team helps you as an individual. Overall, the correlation between the two ways of measuring things is about 70%. So it's, it's, it's valid. It's a natural way of looking at things. But we think our way is a little bit better. Fine. Now, how do we test this? Well, the good news or the bad news, however you're going to think about it, the first four things are basically done by construction. We created the league, we created these rules, we back tested, we simulated, it's done. It's, it is meritocratic, it is comprehensive, it is complete, and it is simple, done. But is it fair? Is it the case that any athlete in any position can move up or down on the leaderboard? Is it competitive? Do the teams balance out? And is it valid? Does the draft order, in fact, correlate with the leaderboard status? So to look at that, uh, we can look at, as you watch this leaderboard, Look at the uh, distribution of um, players. They move up and down. Uh, they move left and right. Uh, the thing you'll definitely notice, of course, is Kat Osterman stands out. Uh, if you watch her, the, she's the leader almost every week. Every week, I think. She, week three, look how long it takes for other players to catch up to what she did in week three. She's about a week ahead of everybody on this leaderboard. Uh, it's a five-week season. We switch teams every week. Uh, and cat dominated. So uh, what did we learn? We know the first four by construction and we see that different positions you can move up and down so it is fair. Uh, what about comp competitiveness? What about validity? To test for competitiveness, let's look at the same thing we did with the uh, MLB. Uh, we'll just look at the games where we'll score the games between uh, the teams either using only the wins where you get 50 points per win and that's it, nothing about the innings or our full uh, team point winning system where you get 50 points per inning and 10 points, 10 points per inning and 50 points for the game. So how do you read this chart? The green is the every week we have the top four teams, team one, team two, team three, team four. How did they do against the other teams? Uh, this is based on actual historical results. Team one against team two, they won four times. They won four times against team three and four times against team four. So the total, they got 600 points. So if we look at the pie chart, Team one, which, which is a different team every week, but the first team, the best team, the strongest team, gets 40% of all of the team points if we were to score it just by winning games. But if we include the innings, that drops from 40 down to 35, and primarily it goes to team three, going up from 17% to 21%. Now, it's not a perfectly even pot. It's not 25, 25, 25, 25, 25, or however. It's not 425. It's not all equal. Why? Because the first team is the best team. It's the, it's the number one player, you know who that is, uh, is the captain, and she drafts who she wants to be on Team Osterman. Uh, the, it shouldn't be completely equal, but it should be less unequal than this. So we can conclude that it is indeed competitive uh, in a good way. What about the validity? So we want to look at the draft order. We don't, what do we want to compare it to? Do, the overall leaderboard, which includes the team wins and MVP points? Not clear. The, uh, the, the, you want the leaderboard, you want people to be drafting based on their expectation of how they will produce on the field, right? The, whether you win or lose is a little bit beyond your control. Conditioning on your skill level, there's, there's randomness, right? Um, so we, we want to see a correlation between the draft order. So here we, at the top left is the top draft pick and the number one leaderboard based only on individual stats. Does that make sense? So we're just looking at the subset of leaderboard that has to do with individual stats. Uh, and here's the, the four weeks. So the week one, obviously, we didn't have a leaderboard, right? There's, they, they start off, everyone starts off fresh. But at the end of week one, we have a leaderboard for the end of week one. And players are ranked from here to here on the x-axis. And on the y-axis that at the top, number one is the first pick. That's almost always Kat Osterman. Um, we would like to see that as the draft pick goes down, the leaderboard goes down. So we'd like to see a negative slope. And indeed we do. 
it's and it's statistically significant and the r squared is about 30 percent in other words it is the case that the draft order roughly follows the leaderboard of individual points not perfectly because there are a lot of positions involved right once there's only one catcher left on the board for example there's no reason to take her early right you would wait until the end to potentially take her good so that we've we've satisfied everything it's all valid that's great the biggest conclusion, of course, is that an ideal league is, in fact, possible. And not only possible, but it's been done. Uh, uh, now it's done. It's finished in softball, very successful, and volleyball is halfway through. Uh, lacrosse is coming up. There are open questions about the future. What else can we ask about this situation? Well, we looked at draft order to see if it was related to past performance. But what about future performance? Maybe part of the reason that the draft order differs from the individual stats leaderboard, among the other reasons we mentioned, one of the reasons might be that the captains know something or feel something about the players that they're choosing, the athletes that they're selecting, that someone's a little bit injured or was a little bit off in the last game and maybe they drop down. Or you see that they've been performing in, a, in an increasing way where you just know them as a person and you know they were going through so whatever. You may have some other information that the draft order itself may be predictive of next week's performance, in addition to probably being correlated, as we've seen, to last week's performance. That's one open question for research that we should be looking at later. Um, how can captains optimize team construction? Is there a metric? Is there a system for uh, taking into account the limitations? We need so many of these players at these positions and what we know about other teams and what they need. Is there a way that we can help the captains construct their teams as they're drafting. And the last question among others that we could consider is MVP voting. Now, MVP voting has been really remarkably well, working really remarkably well, both in softball and volleyball, but there is a bit of an incentive issue, at least a potential concern. Um, it, it's a lot of votes. And to the extent players want to collude or play with the system and use the MVP votes in a weird way, um, to give points to some particular athlete or something else at the end of a season, atop the leaderboard, whatever it is, uh, that could become an issue. It hasn't yet. Uh, and we have some ideas about how to deal with that. One of the things, though, is to remember the leaderboard is not like, uh, let's say, the NBA draft, where it's winner take all. Being number one is the greatest, number two is whatever, you're, you're doomed to mediocrity. No, it's, it's a sliding scale. So the difference between one and two, there's some, diff there's some advantage, obviously, but it's not an enormous drop off that uh, like it used to be, let's say, in, in leagues where teams needed to tank in order to get to the top and so on. So that's Athletes Unlimited. If you learn nothing else today, the biggest takeaway is that Kat Osterman is one of the most dominant athletes of any sport of all time. Uh, and we learned that through our leaderboard. Thank you very much.